Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Today, we're in Cologne with Europe Active at the European Health and Fitness Forum. Thanks for FIBO, we're invited to speak with the president, Dave Stalker, the founder and CEO of Europe's largest fitness chain, Rennie Moss, Carsten Holsch from Deloitte, and a number of high-profile members of Europe Active. The conversation focused around the latest research and data from Deloitte, an open and honest assessment about the real state of the European fitness industry and the short and long-term prospects for the sector. As there was so much to cover, we split the episode over two parts, so stay tuned for part two, which will be released early next week. And finally, a personal message. We do not take any sponsors for these podcasts. It's an investment that Escape Fitness makes in the belief that a rising tide lifts all boats. So I want to ask if you get any value whatsoever from this episode, then please share this with one or two colleagues so that we can get this information out to more people. Thanks for listening and please enjoy this episode. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the European Health and Fitness Forum. We're here in Cologne in Germany. Um, 100% chance of rain today, but we are in the presence of fitness royalty and the newly formed World Active. So I'd like to introduce Barry Elvish, who's from Oz Active, Aussie, 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 and has been travelling around uh, Europe, which has been awesome, and also the interim chair for World Active. And then we also have Amy Thompson, very good friend from and colleague from the US, who is owner and CEO of Idea Health and Fitness Association. Just so I get it right. And your interim vice chair for this group, which comes together tomorrow for the very first time, its very first year. Who's coming together and what is this organisation? Okay, so we come together tomorrow face to face. A lot of people will be here tomorrow for the World Active Assembly. There'll be a voting process to elect the new council. There'll be seven people elected. That council will then, through that group, elect their chair and deputy chair and so on and that sort of gear. So this is the first chance we've come together. We have European people we here. We have New Zealand, we have Australian, we have Africans, we have Middle East, we have Indians, we have Singaporeans. Uh, it's a really international coming together. How many? Uh, I'm thinking maybe about 35 or 40. Yeah, That's plus, incredible. Plus some people online. Incredible. So yeah, it's, look, it's fantastic. I and mean, when you consider this came from just a thought bubble almost of a few people that had an idea we needed to do something to help the sector to, to capitalise on the opportunities that COVID has given us, unless they had given us opportunities. They've given us huge nightmares as well, of, right, course, of course, but we heard this morning right. that we're bouncing back really well. But we need to, I guess, capitalise on those opportunities. So really so this, looking forward to it. So this was an idea that was perhaps out there, but probably the pandemic has accelerated the need for this, exasperated it probably? Yeah, I, look, I yeah. think so. And some of the conversations I've had over the last 12 months have been with many people from the sector, uh, including the World Health Organisation, and they are looking for a singular voice okay. internationally. Okay. And we see this as an opportunity to actually provide that voice. Having said that, getting, uh, I guess, engagement, acknowledgement from the World Health Organisation is lovely and it's important, but it's not the end of the process. Right. We need to make sure that we actually get some runs on the board. Right. And that's what I'm sure they will be able to talk about as well. We can talk about it a little bit later. So tomorrow is the start of getting something moving from, I guess, uh, theory Yes. through to actual practice okay. and agreeing on some <coughs> excuse me some KPIs for the next 12 months. Right and those that I have spoken to are very action oriented and I think that's Absolutely. the point. So Amy perhaps talk us through what are some of the things we can look forward to or the group will be meeting over the next coming days. Yes so we'll be getting a report from each of the working groups that have been out tackling some of our just initial um, initiatives. So and we have four of those We right? have four work groups they're the public affairs group we've got the uh, credentials and standards group and the inclusion and diversity group, both within our sector and the people we serve. And what am I missing, Barry? The fourth? Uh, skills and workforce. Skills and workforce. Yes. These groups are giving their presentations of what they've been able to accomplish in the previous 12 months. And then on top of that, we'll be really setting initiatives for the coming year. Great. And this is all volunteer at this point, Absolutely, isn't it? And yeah. people are running real businesses and having yes. impact in their countries. And you also talked a bit about autonomy. You don't want to be strangled by something that's not a, not really effective in your country. Is that, am I understanding yeah, so that correctly? The idea is almost like United Nations of right. our sector. Uh, so the constituent members will have, they'll still have retained their own autonomy and how they operate their own governance, their own territorial issues. But they'll come together to use that scale to leverage off each other's experiences learnings, mistakes, because we'll make mistakes. So we want to be able to, I guess, really capitalise on the good things that are happening, try and avoid the bad things. But the key thing is here, it's an umbrella organisation. We're not telling them you must do this, you must do that. We're hoping that we can actually help the country members from uh, developing nations 
to help them lift their standards up, but it won't be a dictate, it'll be a contextual based support mechanism. Yeah, that sounds really great. And then I guess to measure progress over time, and I get that you're both really driven, what sort of things would you expect on the scorecard? You're at year zero now, what would you look as being the things that you're going for each year, do you think, Amy? Yeah, so really starting with what are the initiatives we think we can accomplish in a 12 month span, um, setting those out. We know research is needed. That's a key objective of ours is to find, you know, how are people moving? What are what is needed in terms of us um, gathering data from all of our different constituents and continents and then using that to set further goals of what is going to be needed in terms of the different work groups we talked about, whether it's around inclusion and diversity or whether it's around the skills and workforce or the standards and credentials. But how do we use that key data to reach our ultimate goal, which is moving more people more often? And I think, you know, as we come together um, and we're all volunteering our time and we are unfunded at the time, so I'm just putting yeah. that out yeah, there. Yeah, I was just going to say, where's the money coming from? That was my next question. Yeah, there is none yet, but okay. will be one of the other things we need to do is to set up our membership. And what does that entail? How do we bring in dollars? One, to make sure that each um, that these initiatives are funded so we can keep them moving, but also as the organization continues to evolve, how do we, how do we continue to source the, or the resources we need? Right, and that could come from a, a number of different places, from government, I guess, right through to actual businesses, businesses right through to brands. brands. Um, and, and also as we extend, and it's probably my next question for you, Barry, is we're in the fitness segment, we're expanding into wellness, we're trying to blend with health. You know, that's a journey. I know that we speak completely different languages right now. It sounds easy, it's, it's not. How do you see us building those relationships so that we become, rather than being adjacent, we're somewhat coordinating with health, with wellness in the broader sense. Look at the risk of upsetting some of the people that may be listening to this uh, podcast. I Please think. do. I don't think that's an option to go back to business as usual right. pre-COVID. Right. If we're very honest, our industry is very much in its, uh, it's a very maturing industry. Uh, it's got a long way to go to actually get to its next stage. I think one of the problems that we've had, and I can speak from Australia here, is that we were impacted so badly by policy makers, yeah. chief health officers, et cetera, making decisions on our operations because we'd spent the previous 20 years talking to ourselves, yes. <laughs> not basically telling the good, the, the message that we do mm -hmm. and the good that we actually do. And so therefore we were an easy scapegoat yeah. for, for people that wanted to be seen to be doing something. So they targeted us. I mean, in Australia we had this ridiculous situation that we all lumbered with tattoo parlours and brothels, for goodness sake. But I think we actually contributed very much that to ourselves. So the risk for the sector, from my point of view, and I don't come from the sector, so please excuse, yeah, yeah. Please excuse any uh, ignorance on this, but the risk is to go back to a business as usual because we know it works. Mm -hmm. If we do that, and when COVID-35 or 46 or something comes in the future, guess what? It's gonna be exactly the same again. What's happened, in, in a, and again in Australia, is the health departments have actually engaged with us. Right. Like most other places in the world, we were told we could only go outside during lockdowns for four reasons. Shopping, medical appointments, if we couldn't work from home, and exercise. Mm -hmm. No one talked about fitness, no. it was all exercise. Mm -hmm. The health departments have actually said to us in Australia, we had no idea mm -hmm. the role your sector plays in preventative health. Right. We have no idea the role you can play even more in the future. Right. So I think there's a huge opportunity to us to actually shift. Right. It will require some fundamental changes to how we do business. It may even, heaven forbid, talk about regulation. Right. But if we want to be taken seriously and get into that, as you mentioned before, health department funding, all the rest of it, we've got to move away from sport thinking right. and away from fitness thinking, in my mind, to movement, exercise and so on. Right, so grow up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, grow up really. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then, Amy, what would yeah. what um, commentary would you place, I guess, from a US perspective based right. on this? Yeah, so yeah. Um, you and I live in the wonderful state of California, which <laughs> we too experienced some of the worst shutdowns in the pandemic. So for our, my constituents and our business owners, we were significantly impacted. Early on when I was first contacted um, to have our association represented, um, Barry sh said something really powerful is that it has to happen in my lifetime. Like this is my lifetime's work. And that means a lot to me bringing up um, 
my association, being a new owner, what can we do? How do we support our individuals and our business owners in a way that will impact future generations um, to ultimately get more people moving, but to help our business owners and fitness professionals to have respected careers whereby we have whatever regulation. Listen, I'm not here to debate certification, licensure, any of those. I just know that what happened during the pandemic cannot, we cannot repeat history. Introducing the next big thing in functional training, the Escape Barrow, a revolutionary training tool that combines a loaded farmer's carry with a sled push to develop hip, grip, and core strength. Developed in partnership with Pete Holman, inventor of the TRX Rip Trainer and Nautilus Glute Drive, the Escape Barrow can be rolled, pushed, dragged and carried. The Escape Barrow packs a punch with an impressive load capacity of 440 pounds and with a two-stage galvanized paint covering process, it's also ideal for outdoor use. So head over to escapefitness.com forward slash barrow. That's escapefitness.com forward slash barrow to find out more. Enjoy the rest of this episode. And I think, you know, I've just got to also add there that my lifetime is much shorter than <laughs> Andy's So we've really lifetime. got to get going. So we've really, got to, we're get really going. got to get going. No, I love that. So five years. In, in five years, what would we like to have achieved? Like, you I'd know. Like to, well, hopefully I'm still alive yeah, in five years. Well. <laughs> no, look, I would, I would actually like to see World Active as the preeminent uh, organisation in, in our sector internationally. It's very important to have things like the World, World Health Organization recognition and research and all that sort of stuff happening in the background. We've actually got to get some runs on the board. So listening to the Ukraine representative this morning, we should be partnering with them on their, uh, you know, Get Active for Peace Day internationally. Yes. Many countries uh, like Australia, we run our own award programs. We should have an in that should fit into an international program, which then should be presented as part of a World Active Summit. The World Active Summit should take place around the world not in one place every year, around the world. It should have a rotating uh, chair, obviously, and things like that. I would like to see many more females involved mm -hmm. because I walk into this room today and it's... A lot of suits. A lot of suits, 85% <laughs> male, and yet the, we saw with the data this morning... Our sector. The sector is female, mm -hmm. and it's growing female. And in our membership in Australia, two-thirds of our PTs are females. We don't see that represented here. No. So we've got to, it's got to become more inclusive, and the work that Jennifer's been doing yes. uh, is just just mind-blowing. Yeah. To come back to Amy's point and your question about the funding, the funding will come once we demonstrate the value. Yeah. Yeah. And I very much believe that. So Amy, how do people get involved with yeah. this? Um, yeah, so at this point- put things on the agenda, yeah. see opportunities, how do they bring that to this yeah, group? Yeah, so at this point, um, if you are leading an association, a registry, and you're in any of the continents in the world, we wanna hear from you now. Um, let's get you involved, let's pick you up to speed of where we are today. If you want to support the initiative, if you're a brand, if you're a business, if you work in the healthcare space, please reach out to us as well because we want to work hand in hand with all of these organizations. And of course, there will be membership opportunities and funding opportunities for everyone who is passionate about helping us move these initiatives. Well, thank you both. I mean, it's I'm just so, my heart is full seeing this initiative with such you know, with such enthusiasm behind it. And everyone I've spoken to is very, very upbeat. And often it's sort of not, it's not an eye roll moment. It's like, we got to get busy. We've got so much work to do. So applaud you both on your efforts and thank you for all your volunteer work. But thank you for joining the Escape Your Limits podcast here at EHFF in Germany. Thank Thanks, you so Emma. much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Well, fascinating day. Now we've got the big dog here. We've got uh, Renee Mos, who is the CEO of that little brand called Basic Fit. You are now, your public listed company, We've just seen the stats from Herman and also Carsten as well, just showing um, a wonderful comeback for the brand. So tell us a little bit about Basic Fit, because you started off, you were just telling us off camera, 300 clubs, you're now at? We're now at, to be exact, 1,285. 1,285 clubs. <laughs> and you're in the HVLP sector, which the budget sector, which is just absolutely performing really well coming out of COVID, correct? Right. Yeah, so we, so yeah, a little bit about basic fit. So we are uh, active in six countries now, yeah. and uh, we're a Dutch company. I started in Holland, then moved to Belgium, Luxembourg. But so living in Ibiza, which is hence the tan. <laughs> living in Spain, living in... Uh, <laughs> living in paradise. <laughs> so it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a crazy ride during Corona. And I'm, I'm very happy that we could say again, we're back on uh, pre-COVID levels. So amateur clubs are again on those uh, levels. One country a little bit better than the other, but on average, it's actually even better. 
So, but it was uh, it, it was not a fun period uh, being close to so many uh, such a long time, and also sometimes really frustrating. Like the restaurants and the bars in France were open, and the gyms had to close, which I, you just can't believe it. Uh, but but anyway, overall we came out well. What what is it about the Dutch that seem to live in you know based in this tiny little country, and and yet they seem to dominate so many different areas. And he's saying that because he's married I'm to mar one. I am married to one. But <laughs> well, then you know. <laughs> it's better you explain. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's quite impressive, though, really. You know, you've, you've grown to that size from such a, you know, a country where you would say there's relatively limited potential if you count the, you know, the number of clubs you could open in, in Holland. Yeah, Holland is uh, actually, Holland is with 17 million inhabitants, is, is, was a, re a really good uh, country to start because uh, we started off with Mid Market, by the way, so under the Health City brand name. That was successful for a while, but w what we saw in other countries that the, the low cost, uh, the planets of the world, uh, were much more successful. Uh, so we slowly switched from Health City, the premium uh, Mid Market model, to Health City Basic. We first called it Health City Basic. But yeah, people didn't understand it really. The, so we were making advertisement, uh, Health City Basic, uh, 1999, and they would go into one of our premium health cities, and then it was 99 uh, euros. So uh, so we had to pick a second uh, brand name. So uh, that that became uh, Basic Fit, and yeah, and slowly we closed closed or turned around all the health cities that we could turn around to to the Basic uh, Fit model, and uh, and then start opening new clubs and. Yeah, when we got listed, we had around 300 clubs. That was in 2016. Yeah, now, uh, end of this year, we will have uh, 1,400 clubs open. We are building at the moment, um, yeah, we're opening like four four clubs a week, which oh, is... Uh, that is crazy. And you're serving about, I think if I remember the numbers, about three and a half million? Yeah, we have point. now over three and a half million uh, members, which is, uh, yeah, it's, it's good. Of course, we're never uh, satisfied, right? We're no. in, we're in uh, countries where the fitness penetration is really low. Uh, Belgium, France, it's like seven, eight, nine percent. Uh, while in the Netherlands, it's like sixteen or seventy percent. I think in the US, it's even twenty-two. So there's still a lot, a lot to do. Not only for basic fit, but uh, for every fitness. Uh, if it's a boutique or a premium model, I think for for all models, there's a lot, uh, big opportunity still in uh, in Europe. But yeah, we uh, are focusing on uh, taking a big uh, part of that uh, potential growth. A lot of people look at your part of the sector and they think, oh, it must be basic. But actually, I know enough to know there's a lot going behind the scenes. You have a very thorough digital journey and things like that. How do you see the business? Like, What are you pushing for now in terms of innovation in serving all of those members? Yeah, I think we try to make it as easy as possible for uh, for the customers uh, and, and personalize everything. Uh, if you're a male, you get a different uh, than, than a female. So you get different, somebody who's been in the gyms before or somebody who's just starting for the first time, they get a different journey, of course. Uh, so we're really personalizing things. Uh, yeah, we have the 24 seven uh, opening that you don't have to think, uh, is it open now or you can always go. Uh, and we have uh, yeah, invested a lot of uh, money in security. So in every club we have like 25 cameras. Right. Uh, we have a, a security room that's open 24 seven. So yeah, we have been, uh, the main thing, I think the main driver for people to go to a gym is that it's close by. Right. I don't think it's the five euros more or less which is making the big difference, but I think the main driver has to be close to where you work or close to where you live and then you will join. Uh, that's that's one, and then the second has to be clean, uh, of course, and um, yeah, it has to be easy in and out. In the early days with Health City, we signed everybody on a twelve year, a twelve month contract, and made it difficult for them to cancel. Even big companies still now ask people to go over to the club to 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 fill in a form to cancel it. If you do it like that, then of course they will never come back, right? Uh, so we make it easy to stop, so you can. Do it by phone. You can do it by computer. Uh, you can do it in a club. You can do it any way you want. And I think uh, because fitness is not uh, as interesting as playing golf or playing tennis, because then you can win a match, hit a great stroke, or have a great feeling. That's something. But yeah, a dumbbell is a dumbbell, right? So you're not you're not going to get the same feeling as winning a soccer match or a tennis match or anything like that. So it's, in a way, it's boring, uh, and you need to have a lot of discipline. So people stop, but they start again. So if you make the journey to start easy and the journey to stop easy, then the chances that they return to you is, is, is very big. What do you think, as, as um, you, you, know, you've been in, you know the industry, you've been in it for a long time, what, what do you think has really 
been some of the reasons why you guys have won amongst because there's been a lot of competition he, he, you know, I know prior to you guys that the, in Holland the fitness first were were there a long time ago and they were in all the countries that you were in but you guys have have had a lot of people com going trying to compete with you but you, you seem to be the dominant player within Europe what, what would you say have you has, has caused that success if you had to put, put your thing, finger on it yeah well I think the focus on the members, I think we are really focusing what is good for the member, I think that is one, and we are focusing on a cluster strategy, so we are opening a lot of clubs, let's say we have a city of 100,000 inhabitants, then we typically open three clubs, because then there's always a club close by, so instead of uh, going all over France, we first went to the north of France, opened the first 100 club, then we went in the Paris region, and then we went the, so we, we're doing it, re, actually we're doing it city by city, and uh, so we, we were thinking about 30,000 people, one club, that is how we think about it, so if it's 90,000 people, we want to have three clubs. But the thing is, what other competition is doing, they open one club, right? And then you open one club, let's say, in the middle of the city of 90,000 inhabitants. But then you will never open a second, because that will hurt you. But we are looking at that city and saying, okay, then we need one club here, one club there, and then we are the logical choice. So we're doing it city by city. I think that is the big... And then you're the logical choice in that city, and then you're top of mind, because if you think about fitness, they have to think about you, right? That's what we heard today in uh, some of the speakers. And that can only be the case if you are around, if they can see you, if, if you are around. So uh, instead of going to, if you go back to our, the good thing is we were able to make a lot of mistakes and still survive. So we, we, with Health City, we made a lot of mistakes. If you look back, we did so many stupid things, unbelievable. But, but we still were able to have enough cash flow to, 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 to continue. Uh, but we learned a lot from that. So we went from one country to three and from three to six. Well, that is stupid, of course. You should go first be the logical choice in one country. When we went to Belgium, we first focused on Antwerp. Once we had 40 clubs in Antwerp, we went to Brussels. When we had 40 clubs in Brussels, we went to the next. And that's how we conquered. Oh, conquered is a big word. But <laughs> that, that's, how we, like that. that's how you we... You could probably go with it. <laughs> that's how we uh, grew our uh, company in, for instance, Belgium. And that's how we're doing it actually in, in every country. So let's, uh, let's take Spain now. Uh, so the first 40 clubs were more or less in Madrid. And, and after we had like uh, 40 or 40, 50 clubs in Madrid, we went, now we went to Malaga. And there we built the first, uh, I don't know, six or eight clubs in Valencia, now six, eight clubs. And now we're starting also in uh, Barcelona. And then we have 70 clubs in Barcelona, and then we have 40 clubs in Malaga, and then we look for other areas in Spain again. So we do really focus then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we want to be the logical choice. The thing is, nobody's going to drive to another city no. to go to one of our clubs. No. Nobody's going to do that. But the, the thing is, people often, if they're lucky, uh, where they live, they close, also work close by. Yeah? And nobody's going to drive two hours to their work, hopefully, for them. So if you have, the, if you have those three clubs in, of, or uh, 40 clubs in Brussels, there's always a club around, where you work or where you live, always. Did you ever have, when you were, when you were in like, Health City, did you ever have the ambition to be where you are today? Was, it, or was, was that part of the, the plan or did, did it kind of evolve over time? We always had, had ambition to be a European player. So I'm a failed tennis professional, so I did that for a, for, a, a, great story. for, for a few it? years. <laughs> and of course, uh, with tennis, you, uh, uh, you lose every week uh, or you win the tournament. Or, uh, but mostly, well, I didn't win a lot of tournaments. So every week I lost. It could be the first round, second or third, but every week you lost. And you learn from that. And, and that's how we also, I think, built a basic fit. We, we, we tried a lot of things and it was not correct. And we stopped again, tried again, and stopped again. And that's how we learned a lot from all the learnings of that health city period uh, in, in combination with ambition. Eh, the team that we have is a very ambitious group. It's not me, of course, I cannot do anything myself. So we have a big group of people, a, big, a good group of people that is highly motivated and, and really wants to open a lot of clubs and make fitness accessible and, and get more people moving. Uh, yeah, that, that gives a lot of energy. Eh? Working in our office, uh, well, you've been there uh, a lot. It's, it's a very positive uh, group of people, and, and, and they're really going for this, uh, this story, eh? this 
three, three and a half thousand clubs in uh, 2030, and that's our goal. And uh, I'm pretty sure that we will reach that. I'm sure you will too. And what, what's after Spain? You'll keep taking Europe? Uh, yes, we, uh, so, so for now we are busy in the countries where we are. We just opened this week club number 700 in France. Uh, but, but we think we can yeah, easily grow to uh, 11, 12 or 1300 in France. So we still have a long uh, way to go in France. Uh, we just started in Germany now. We have uh, opened the first five clubs. Uh, we, we signed already like 60 plus uh, right. locations. It takes a long time to get the license. So that it's in a new country, it always takes a bit longer. Spain is now going. Uh, uh, after, uh, after Madrid, now we're opening in, in more cities. We passed the first 100 now. Going to open another 40 this uh, year. So, yeah, so we are in all countries really uh, rolling out. Those 3,000 clubs we think sh uh, uh, should be in the countries where we are now. We don't have to add new countries. Go beyond, right. Yeah. But there are, there are a lot of opportunities in a lot of countries, even, uh, even bigger countries that you think, uh, well, maybe it is crowded enough, but we think with the model that we have. Uh, yeah, we can really make a difference because our cash flow break even point is on 1700 members. We have always focused on uh, getting uh, automating everything. We can run a club without staff. We're not doing that, by the way, but we right. can run a right. club without yeah. staff because everything is automated. Right. We invest millions of euros every year for the last 10 years on IT to get it as smooth as possible and fully automated. So on 1700 uh, members, yeah, you can also open a club in, let's say, a village of 10,000 people. Well, for instance, Planet cannot do that. Right. Uh, they need an area of, I don't know, 70, I don't know their model, but like, let's say 70,000 people or something like that. So we, with being cash flow break even on 1,700 members, uh, yeah, you can all go also to smaller places and, and still get a real, uh, real club experience because our clubs on average are 13, 1,400 square meters. Uh, that's a real gym, right? You see a lot of clubs with five, six hundred square meters and then they have the showers in and they have a small GX room and they have strength and cardio, but then you actually have nothing because then you have everything a little bit and you always have to wait if you want to do something. But if you have a box of 1,400 or 1,300 square meters, you can put everything in. And you can also follow the trends then. So if the trend is uh, running uh, on your hands, well, we can make space so you can run on your hands. So you can always go with the flow. You can always go uh, with the new... Uh, new things. My last question, with such a big voice, um, I guess in Europe and just with such horrific lockdowns and periods, were you able to use your power as a businessman to really help with advocacy, like politically, joining associations? And I know that Basic Fit did a lot of things to be one of the voices in those conversations. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we spent a lot of time and a lot of money on it in all countries where we were active. Uh, looking back, it was not wise that we didn't spend that time before. Beforehand, right. Uh, so first has to go wrong before you, you find, uh, hey, I need those politicians to, to really yeah. have them listen to the fact that the bar is worse than a fitness facility. Uh, bars where they drink alcohol sitting close to each other and, and, and a fitness, there's a big and space in between yourself. and you, you're working <laughs> yeah. your body. So Do you feel like they heard you? Do you yeah, think yeah, we're in a yeah. different space now? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. I think... Uh, uh, in all countries, uh, France, uh, all countries uh, are, are way, we, we know how, uh, how to navigate, how, it, how to navigate it and right. talk to them. We hired professional uh, companies to help us with that, but we have made the contacts ourselves now and, and, and that's going to help. Uh, let's uh, say, uh, hopefully nothing like that will happen again, but, but if something happens. Will. Of course it will. <laughs> but <laughs> if it happens will again, happen. <laughs> yeah, something will always happen. So, uh, so yeah, we know, uh, we know a lot more than before COVID. Yeah. My last question then, a lot of people here are trying to crack the formula and, and um, a lot of conversations are going on from people who are just getting into the business and um, at, at different stages. And I guess you're certainly one of the success stories. What would you say has been one of the most difficult parts of the business to crack and get right when you, when you sort of look back on, on your career? Yeah, I think it's a lot of details, right? It's, it's all in the details and all these little small things that you have to really think about and, and improve on, on small scale. If, if I look to the total market, I think not everybody should focus on low cost because if, if there's only low cost gyms, it's a terrible experience. You need to be able to go to a boutique or do other things as well. Because as I said, uh, it, it's kind of boring, right? The dumbbells and the treadmills, uh, there's a lot of 
uh, investment in, uh, in, in equipment, etc., but it's still the same equipment, right? We still have the treadmill and, and we still have the same seven cardio pieces, which we had 30 years ago also. So not a lot has changed there. So the whole experience of moving inside and outside and at home, also something we focus on and also something we coach people on through our app to really not only work out in the gym, but also when you're on holiday, if you don't have time, do it at home. Uh, they can log into a class, uh, a live class, or they can just play a film that we uh, uh, made for them. So I think the hard thing to crack what you said is, um, yeah, think of something that you feel comfortable. If you are really good at personal training or giving coaching, just be the best in that. And if you're really good at group classes, it'll be the best in that. And then just build clubs with just group classes. And, and then when you get the details right, I think you can make a huge successful company in, in but in all these different tents, let's not do all the same thing. Let's, uh, let's be creative and, and, and make it more fun, more different things. I think that is, uh, yeah. Love it. Thank, well, you thank, thank you very much. much. And Appreciate congratulations. Your thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. So we're in for a treat now. We have Carsten Hollis, who's from Deloitte and who's been working with Europacta for how many years now? More than 10 years. More than, I thought it was only 10 years old. Yeah, <laughs> but we did some other research before. Prior. Right. Prior, so um, from Deloitte, so deep analytics into our sector. So we would love to start with, there's so much talk, we come from America, so we're hearing slightly different narrative. What's happening in Europe generally, financial markets, fitness trends, post pandemic, and you're dealing with other things, you're much closer to the war. Um, you've definitely had energy issues more than we've felt in the US. So just give us a sort of a, a headline sort of what's happening over here. Sure, I think overly, uh, when you look at the environment for, let's say, businesses um, overly and, and generally, it's, it's, it's getting tougher. As you just pointed out, I mean, energy costs are increasing. Uh, there are really severe supply chain issues around for, for companies. Uh, but you're also feeling lack of getting good people uh, to work in, uh, in companies as well. So we as Deloitte as well, we're looking for, for the best talent, of course, and, and, and people um, are increasingly uh, hard to get really from the university, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of things which are happening and, and you mentioned briefly the, well, I wouldn't call it financial crisis. I mean, there were some obviously coming from the US, uh, some, some topics uh, like Silicon Valley Bank, but also uh, in Switzerland, what happened there with the merger of two big banks. So that obviously is, is, is a kind of, I wouldn't call it turmoil, but it's kind of, yeah. Uh, uncertainty uh, for for financial institutions and if businesses are financed obviously by banks uh, that would affect them by increasing interest rates inflation is also a big topic uh, especially on on uh, paying let's say more salaries to to the employees and as we know the fitness industry was not always known for paying the best salaries to their employees so uh, and, and that's hitting them as well uh, on the other side, what we have seen from a consumer perspective is that um, after obviously the pandemic hit us, um, most of the fitness studios are now coming back quite well. And um, I, I called it bounce back really. And, and we see, already see uh, in some of the countries um, levels um, back to 2019 um, after the, the Corona uh, pandemic uh, with caused then a lot of lockdown periods, et cetera, as well. So I think overall, um, from a consumer perspective, it's quite positive and there are a lot of uh, opportunities for the industry. Uh, the environment from a financial perspective, from a cost perspective, being personal cost, being cost for the real estate, it's, it's getting uh, more challenging. But overall, I think the picture is uh, not as dark as um, we thought uh, two years ago and really uh, Corona hit us and we, we, we yeah, the, the clubs needed to shut down, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, That's great. And then how would, you, how would you look at each of the sectors right now? I mean, we know Basic Fit, our friends and the HVLP are, you know, sort of killing it right now. Has the bounce back been sort of equivalent across those different things? Or are you seeing different things in the, say, low price versus the premium versus digital? Like, what are you seeing in that mix? I think... It was a transformation, uh, and I mean, the transformation is always good for operators or also for corporates who do um, differentiate from others. So, meaning, uh, if you look um, 
not only at the fitness industry, but you can look at the supermarkets, you can look at the fashion industry, etc. And those who have a clear positioning, being at the low end for the discount or budget, whatever you call it, or being at a premium side, they have appreciated that. When you are kind of stuck in the middle, in the medium, you really have difficulties of differentiating yourself. And therefore, I think it's both at two ends, uh, one, the discount or value for money operators have appreciated this and also the premium operators because there was clear differentiation and customers really are more mature, are more educated and really have a, a wider um, offering now in, on hand and therefore can decide whether they want to train uh, in a discount or value for, for money operator or if they can afford a premium operator. Uh, and the medium operators really have difficulties of positioning themselves towards the two ends. So I think um, if, if you are on this, either on this end or on the other uh, side of things, then, then you are well positioned. Um, you reference um, <clears throat> opportunities uh, uh, just a moment ago. Like what, what are some of those opportunities that you're seeing or things that we should be thinking about or looking at? Yeah, I mean, opportunities, uh, also the transformation brings more opportunities and sometimes also the need for a wider thinking in the industry. So if I look back and, and you, you said we are working now with Europe Active for more than 10 years, I'm in this industry now for more than 24 years, actually looking for the German market. And what I've seen is uh, that the industry was ever growing. It was ever growing. So there was always a tailwind, you know. And I'm, I'm, I'm a cyclist now. And, and I mean, with tailwind, you don't need to train that hard. You're going just easily and you, you go there, you know, right? And you have a speedy tempo, et cetera, et cetera. But now with the headwind, uh, with pandemic, and also with also the transformation coming from digitalization, people are now used to more offerings without paying for it. So I think we briefly touch base on the digital offering, which you get via YouTube, by all the channels, which is not paid for. So people are getting used to that. And you really have to cope with this high level of, uh, of quality they, they, they can get. Uh, but I think also if operators do think about that actively and, and think about the next mile, um, they could take something out of that and an opportunity I also showed is, um, for example, combine the classical club business, the classical train out in a studio with some advice at home, yeah, a digital channel, um, but also some outdoor fitness. I mean, there were some operators who have taken on that a, a few years um, and, and provided some outdoor fitness, but there were that's focus on outdoor. The others, some home fitness, they were focused on home. Why not combining that and, and, and really um, prepare something for the consumer, which is a broad offering, and trying again then to differentiate themselves. Um, I think that's that's an opportunity now uh, with all the digitalization, uh, which is more or less now in place because also Corona again transformation requested that the operators had certain digital tools to measure how many people are in the club, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that has forced the apps for the usage, etc. And you can use that better. And I think, sorry, a uh, long, uh, long answer to your question. I think one big opportunity as well, I mean, we're talking about movement, we talk about fitness, but what about the nutrition side of things? Yeah. So combining that nutrition plus movement and finding the right partners. Yeah. So for example, here uh, at the FIBO, we see Ali uh, presenting and they have an own booth here, Ali. I mean, the discount uh, grocery retailer in, in Germany or uh, worldwide, I mean, they, they are now going into fitness and, and have a combination between movement and nutrition for the consumers. I think it's a great opportunity as well. Were there, in, in the research, were there any surprises? You've been in this space for 25 years and doing this for 10. In this year, was there anything that you thought was surprising or against how people thought the, the numbers would, would, would come out? Any, anything unexpected? Sometimes uh, really strikes me or surprises me is then that... Um, I mean, as you said, we, I see a lot of opportunities which you can really um, uh, improve yourself and get more out of that. But uh, again, with the uh, very positive environment for many years, we have seen um, people tend only to react rather than to be proactive. And that sometimes strikes me that they have these, let's say, uh, uh, big ships which are moving and they don't tend to think outside the box sometimes and really get the big ship also to, to the small boats outside and, and test something. So we have learned a lot today about entrepreneurship, how we can 
uh, accelerate and, and how we can do uh, creation of new businesses, etc. So what would be some examples then, just to give, give me an example of that then, like of not thinking... Out. Yeah, for example, when the, when the clubs were, 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 were locked down, uh, so there were kind of fitness operators who have uh, done uh, fitness classes at home, so they have prepared content. Uh, community was was very important for them, so they have uh, uh, rented a studio and, and get some trainer instructors into the room and then present it to their members so they can download it or can view it live on YouTube, uh, so that the content was packed. And that the reaction was partly very, very fast, but on the other side, others were just saying, okay, we, we need to close the clubs, what shall we do? Uh, we can't do anything. And that's, I think, not what what I would have done if I were an operator. Mm, it's interesting. So just uh, tell us a little bit about the consumer survey which you ran last January and you've just rerun that. And you spoke this morning with Herman around six outtakes. So tell us about that. What, what were some of the key messages? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it's quite representative because we have surveyed in 19 countries uh, in total 11,000 uh, people. So it's very interesting also to see the, the range of what people consider to be physically active. So we have not have a very high bar for being physically active, meaning we train out once a week, that meaning, okay, I'm physically active. And that is a range between 40 and 70%, depending on the country you're looking at. And then obviously, if you look at the three uh, main pillars for being active, it's being fitness club, it being outdoor, or it being home fitness, uh, you see some tendency that especially the, the fitness club have bounced back, as I said, for, uh, for new members and, and members again in the club after really the lockdown uh, happened. And uh, home fitness kind of stayed on the same level and outdoor as well. So again, I think the combination of the three is very interesting. And to trigger a consumer, for example, there is a big tendency of combining home and outdoor fitness. But what can I do as an operator to attract those consumers who at the moment not in the club, but do home and uh, outdoor together to get them into the club? So again, think outside the box, what can I provide to them, et cetera, et cetera. But this combination was, for me, was, was quite interesting. And, and now the operators should think about how they can really uh, um, make something out of that. Did anything surprise you in that research this year? Um, I mean, well, not really surprised, but it was a kind of um, confirmation of what we were discussing. So when I'm thinking back, um, I think it was two years ago, I was sitting in a panel with uh, Martin Seibold and, and with, uh, with the, the equipment industry, Technogym, and we were discussing, well, okay, we are all now in the digital world, uh, clubs are closed, what's going to happen? Will they stay in the digital world or will they come back? And we all had the hypothesis, no, we think they will come back. But they will ask for more offering, um, not only the physical activity, but also the digital experience. So that's something which you need to add to your product portfolio as an operator. And I think that was a hypothesis because we didn't know what the future will bring, but that has been confirmed more or less. The good thing is that the fitness operators were able to convert, let's say, these increased offering also in higher prices. So that what we have seen now, uh, when I, I know the numbers for Germany quite well, so that has increased uh, 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 to, to, to price uh, of more than 10%. Uh, so if you take the gross price for an average uh, membership, it's 45 euros now in Germany. And that is obviously a good sign for the operators that they can monetize their digital offering because there are also expenses with those coming and therefore they could put that also in the membership fees. And people really, and that was also a good sign from our consumer part survey, which we do from, uh, from a Deloitte perspective in, in more than these 19 countries or even in 24 countries, we ask about the fear in terms of inflation. And although people are fearing uh, in most of the countries inflation still, and it's, it's really matters to them, uh, it is coming down a bit. And the good thing is that um, if we were asking people where you're going to save money because of this inflation uh, in, in fact, effect, uh, they wouldn't save it in the fitness clubs, which is good. And, and that was, again, I mean, many years back when, when, when Lehman happened, uh, I can remember there was a big study coming out. Um, is fitness affected by this financial crisis? And we talked about banks, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Certainly from that perspective, yes. But it has an effect of uh, consumer demand because people were even substituting, let's say, 
more expensive vacation by a yearly uh, membership fee in a fitness club because they just tend to have something good uh, which was less costly but uh, obviously um, it, it led to a positive effect yeah, it was yeah, considered so it was valuable. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's still, that's still, from what you're saying, I, I saw it on the slide. Then that that confidence in fitness over other things still seems to be, still seems to be there. Yeah, and th and there's a digital decision. I mean, either you pay a membership fee or you don't. So you can obviously save some energy and put the heating down, or you can save some water by showering not only 15 minutes but five minutes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for fitness, it's just do you have a membership or not. Yeah, so, and, and, and people tend to stay on, and that's also been an enhanced by the fact that the fitness operators have increased their membership fees, but only for the new members in many cases. And uh, existing members tend to train out at the lower membership fee, fee. so they, they tend to have a, 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 a lower attrition rate uh, because of that fact, in addition to what I said before. Mm. How is the investment? community looking at things at the moment like we had a chat we've got John Canerick in, in the US and got a feel for where it was out here out there like how are you seeing that in, in Europe then is there still is, is there an extreme concern is, is there some, any optimism like how would you describe that yeah uh, that's, that's quite an interesting question I mean first of all if you look at uh, the shareholders in in the fitness industry in Europe, you will find uh, partly some public listed companies, but also private equity owned companies. And if I can start with private equity owned, I mean, private equity um, still has a lot of money to be spent, so-called dry powder. Right, yeah. And uh, this dry powder is like, say, it's, I don't have the European number, but I have the, the worldwide number. It's more than two trillion uh, US dollar, which they need to spend in order to have certain RIs for their investors, paying back after 10 or 15 years, depending on the contract they have. And uh, this money is still to be spent. And um, obviously, there are some funds which need to realize money in the short term, but others tend to have more patience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And therefore, there might be some changes between the funds of those assets. But I still believe, again, with all the opportunities we have uh, taken into consideration, have discussed before, that there is still some growth to come for the operators, and it's it's still a good investment. Could be a good investment for private equity. Um, when you look at the public markets, I mean how the public markets have uh, evolved over time, and how the valuations have uh, evolved over time. So what the public markets always rate is grow. So uh, if you take, for example, Basic Fit, uh, it's a fast-growing company and that has always been appreciated by um, increasing share prices by, by the shareholders. So people tend to invest in those. Where you don't have that big of a grow, it's more a steady share price and obviously being affected by, by Corona and by those external factors. But it's still um, a kind of good valued business. So um, opportunities are there, both for growing the business uh, if you're publicly listed, but also from a private equity perspective. So. Again, I think uh, it is still a good investment. It could be a, a good investment and, and money is there. So um, I don't see an end uh, from that perspective. Yeah, that's great. Um, you're king of data. So on May the 16th, uh, each year you do with Europactive, correct, a big report, a European report. So that's due to come, which I believe, I believe that you're delivering virtually with Herman. Is that correct? Correct. And then after that, there will actually be that report will be available, I think, on Europactive's website, correct? Correct. So just high level, what does that tell us? What will you be telling us on May the 16th? Yeah, uh, we have actually postponed that. I mean, we used to present it here um, uh, at this forum, but uh, obviously there were the countries were still um, looking for appropriate data. So especially in, in major countries uh, where we do rely on. So for Germany, we have finished that exercise. So we do that with the University of, of Prevention and Health plus the German Fitness Association. We presented the results a month ago, but that's an established process. On other countries where it hasn't been that established, uh, we are still looking for proper data and partly um, public listed companies like, for example, Pure Gym uh, will only publish in two weeks from now. So we wanted to wait for that in order to have all this information and we rather have a report published a month later with proper data 
then have it here with some assumptions. And that's, that's the reason why. And I think uh, it, it will be a good report again. And it has all the usual stuff around M&A activity last year. It has all the stuff around the major countries, the major operators, which we partly have on show three operators today, which we will present there, but also the main operators in the countries, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, uh, yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's probably too arrogant to say it's the Bible of uh, of, uh, of the industry, but it has a lot of data where people can look into and say, well, this is good, this is good data, also for the financial markets, because banks are looking for this data as well for benchmarking, etc. cetera. Yeah. Well, we're Fantastic. looking forward to that and how very German of you, holding off to have all the answers yep. as well as you can, clean yep. up the dirty data and uh, get the insights out. Thank you so much. We always value your guidance and I'm sure our listeners will love hearing what's happening in Europe. So thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So European Health and Fitness Forum, we're very, very excited to hear from the other side, which we don't often hear from, and that is politicians. <laughs> so we've got Dieter here from representing European pa uh, Parliament. Yeah. So tell us... What is your role, why are you here, and what are you seeing? Look, uh, it's really a pleasure for me being here today because there is so many inspiring people and the vibe is really so positive, full of positive energy. So I want to bring this positive energy with me to Brussels. <laughs> uh, but uh, on the topic, I think it's extremely important what you've been doing for the society, that this sector really takes care of the well-being of the society. And we as politicians, we have to find a way how to support you further, how to make sure that uh, everything is available for you and that we reach the audience, that we reach uh, people that are eager to, to start physical activities. We do a lot of campaigns in, in Europe, uh, be, uh, be active one, the uh, campaign is the most successful one. Uh, and it's really about, you know, uh, fun of physical activities and that people realize that it's really good, that it's good not only for your physical, but also mental well-being. Great. Thank you for that background. So pre-COVID and post-COVID feel like different worlds, I guess, politically. We, a lot of us were shut down for very long periods. We were categorised with other sectors that we didn't agree with. What change do you think has happened because of the pandemic and all of the associations coming together? I know you're a very big proponent of working together. What changes have you seen in the last, say, three years? Mm. Huge change, and you are right that the pandemic, the COVID changed a lot. It changed the way how we live now, how we work, but also how we, you know, do physical activities too. I, I can take, for instance, my own example. You know, before I was more active in the fitness centers, now I follow more online classes. And we saw it today from the statistics that uh, more and more Europeans prefer to exercise at home for different reasons. It may be more convenient, less time consuming, more practical, whatever. And this is something we need all to ha take into consideration, especially I think it's relevant for, for your sector, for your business to really think how to address this new behavior of us citizens. Right, and then I guess from a political point of view, what can we do to join hands even closer with politicians, local, national, European, what can we do to further that agenda so that fitness becomes, we've had some great interviews earlier today, how fitness can become almost the prescription for a, a better health before we get sick. Like are there things that we're, they're working with with politicians? Exactly, we need to combine forces. I think the, the most important or the crucial vital uh, goal for all of us is to have a healthy society. You know, and I am uh, I am confident that if we combine forces, if we as politicians make sure that uh, the, 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 we have the right environment, that we also advocate for healthy lifestyle, that it would really contribute to a big change in the society. Uh, I think it, it's uh, crystal clear also from the discussion we had here today that uh, there is a lot we can do more. It's about raising uh, awareness and it's also for, for many politicians to realize that if we have healthy society, that you will see it also in your budget. 
because there won't be so so uh, much spendings mm -hmm. on 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 different illnesses. So it has both the, the social but also economic angle. What would you say, from your perspective, is one of the biggest hurdles that you've got to overcome to make that a reality? It's really perhaps to to uh, the, to push the politicians. <laughs> yeah. uh, not many of us are aware of uh, of uh, the fact how important it is to, to really concentrate on healthy society to support to promote the healthier uh, lifestyle. You guys, you come from the part of the U.S. where it's perhaps more natural yes. to, to, to live a, a healthier life. But, uh, you know, I, I, in Europe, uh, I think we still need to promote it more, to raise, as I said, raising awareness. For me, this is something that I would like to work on. So in the U.S., that equals lobbying. Is that the same in Europe, or are there different ways to influence politicians? In the US, it's generally money. <laughs> money and people put in place to, to push that agenda. Is it the same here? Uh, you look, uh, we work very closely with Europe Active, mm -hmm. uh, and this is really the organization, the umbrella organization of this sector. And they are quite vocal. They, they, they have very strong voice in Brussels. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm always happy to listen to their comments, to their initiatives, because sometimes they have brilliant ideas. You know, uh, in Europe, we have 27 member states. So what is good in Europe is also to share different practices, experiences. What works in one country can work in another. And I wish we can also, you know, uh, extend it to the US so we can exchange our best practices among... Uh, yes, and I get a sense that that's beginning to happen. We've got the World Active uh, Summit happening here for the very first time, 30 to 35 leaders from associations globally. So it really does feel, and we feel it in the industry, there's been a massive consolidation in software companies, in, in services, and, and definitely in, in causes like this. What would your advice be to people that are listening, how can we influence perhaps our politicians? What do you respond to? What is the best way? I get it through the associations, people like Europe Active, UK Active, um, some of the organisations in the US. Are there other ways that we can influence thinking? Look, I think it's our common goal. It's not about you influencing us or me influencing you. I mean, we have a common goal, which is to have healthy society. So we need to work together. Mm -hmm. We need to work together. We need to raise awareness. We need to do different pilot projects also. And uh, one topic that we haven't mentioned yet is also to think with how to use the new technologies, the digital world, how to approach every corner of uh, our countries. And this is really the challenge that is ahead of us. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Wonderful. Free Thank you, Apologies Claudine. for the cough. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very thank much. You. We're in the presence of greatness. We've got one of my old bosses, and wonderful to catch up again, uh, Philip Mills, who's founder of Les Mills International, Les Mills, and also executive director. It's awesome to have you here. We can't wait to hear what Les Mills has been up to. Thanks. So yeah. many things, right? Yeah, yeah, I hate um, And it's great to be here at FIBO. It's just always such a magic convention. There's, so many people here, so much energy, so many different aspects of the industry. Oh, I really love Sibo. So you did a lot through the pandemic. You did a lot of innovation digitally. You created a whole lot of new programs. And you're talking very powerfully in this conference, at least anyway, around Gen Active, the majority of our club owners. So perhaps tell us a little bit about that, because Les Mills really leads sure. a lot of that research. <clears throat> sure. So you guys know I started in the industry 55 years ago, working uh, after school with mum and dad's gym cleaning the locker rooms, and I've seen a lot of change in the industry. Since we really introduced group exercise in 1980, I've watched four generations of group exercise come and go. And when you look at it in that context, it's quite interesting. I watched all of our programs that we did during the, the, the baby boomers era. Well, no, sorry, you didn't do that. You were Gen X. You came after that. And we had high impact, low impact. Um, we had a lot of, lot of dance, and we had some hand weights, and we did have circuits. We had super circuits, which is interesting because they're coming back, back now. Yep. big time now. Um, and I think they're the biggest trend which is happening right now in the whole industry. And I think it's transformative. 
and I'll talk about that in a minute. But then we had the Gen X stuff, so we had, you know, step classes started, barbell classes started, cycle classes started, uh, Tybo, you know, all of the more athletic stuff. We sort of switched out of the le leotards and leg warmers age of the 80s and to that stuff during the 90s. Um, and then with the millennials, we had a whole bunch of new stuff. Strength got bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, strength has been an ongoing trend really since the birth of feminism. Uh, I, I think it goes probably hand in hand with women wanting to be phys physically stronger, but, but feel stronger. There's a lot of research on what goes on biochemically with you know, feelings of empowerment, biochemically and, 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 uh, and, and um, emotionally, just all of those feelings. And that big time increased uh, with the millennials. You know, saw the birth of CrossFit and young women uh, doing, using Olympic weights and, um, and you saw all the hit classes, the super high intensity stuff. And we've sort of gone through this age of very, very high intensity smash yourself stuff. I sense a little bit of a change of some of that coming into Gen Z. You've got still strength is big, big, big. Uh, and you've got also the sort of a, the de-stress stuff. You've got yoga and, um, and Pilates and breathing and all sorts of things like that growing as they have, you know, they really probably didn't come into gym until the 90s. And then you had yoga fusion came with millennials. In the 90s, you weren't allowed to put yoga to music or mix it with Pilates or anything like that. And we were hated when we first did that in the <laughs> exactly, 90s. Exactly, I remember. Um, but, um, but we, you know, now uh, all of that stuff is super really evolving as people want to kind of get through their, their mental health issues, which has become such a big thing. Uh, and, but also, you know, remember yoga and Pilates are a big part strength as well. Um, so we're, yeah, we're seeing a whole new generation, uh, a lot of strength classes, a lot of mind body type of classes and, you know, the evolution of everything else, the evolution of kind of boxing and indoor cycling. And, uh, you know, during the pandemic, everybody went outside and started riding their bikes outside and running outside. I did. Um, and that's a good thing, you know, people kept exercising, but we know that our industry is half about giving expert exercise guidance and it's half about motivating people to exercise. So people run out of motivation and the clubs have to pick that up. You know, we've got to get better with our cycle classes. Um, interesting to see cycle classes were still about number three on the mind body, the big mind body class pass uh, study last year. We've got to, you know, get better with our running stuff, or we've got to do what a lot of clubs have done for years, which is get good at running outdoor groups. You know, there have been a lot of clubs. You look at Sports City in Mexico for years and years. They've got about 30% of the people who joined them to join a running group, and they enroll them for a 10K fun run, and then they're hooked. So lots of ways to, to motivate people, but we have to get Gen Z. That's crucial. 80% of, of gym goers now are going to some kind of gym are uh, Gen Z and Millennial. And the, the biggest joining group is 24 year olds, okay? Uh, not many people join gyms for the first time after 35 years old. Uh, so if you don't get them through their, their 20s and their early 30s, they're gonna go somewhere else. So this is crucial. We have to do, we have to do new exciting stuff for the, the Gen Zs, you know, what we call Gen Active, the Gen Zs and, and the young millennials. Uh, and, and of course, we've got to motivate us oldies like it too. You know, my generation likes to have new stuff. We get bored as well. So uh, we have to do, come out with really exciting new stuff. And the next generation of stuff is there. You know, when I look at it through my 40 years, I, I just look at the generations the and how it's evolving. And it's, it's wonderful. You know, there are all of these fabulous new activities out there that are going to change, change the game up again and we are going to keep evolving. We're the biggest adult sport in the world and we are going to keep growing and growing and growing. Somebody told me 80% uh, of adults are now going to, doing some kind of fitness activities, going to some kind of a gym or doing home fitness. Our last study that we did pre-pandemic said 32, 33% right. going to some kind of a gym. But now with so many people doing digital stuff and all that, Maybe, maybe it really is 80%. I hope it is. Yeah. You were saying about circuits. We had a chat at Ursa about this one. Um, I, I used to do those when I, when I first went to the gym. I'd do weights most of the time. And on a Friday, 
I go to a guy, I think he's called Dave, and Dave Circuits, and it's an old gym, and, and we had a chat about that. So what, what's, what are you seeing on that side of things then? Because you said you got a spark in your eye when you said circuits. It's really coming back again. It's what we did in the 80s and in the 90s. And uh, you'll remember Steve Renata having 150 people in a circuit class at the Auckland City yep. uh, machine and cardio, gym. Machine and cardio. Yeah, 30 seconds <laughs> on, working your way around 75 machines. And, uh, and all of the gyms in Australia and New Zealand at the time experienced that. You know, we started by putting these circuits in the corner of our gym, uh, and then we might have had an old squash court we put them into, and then it got so big that everybody just put them into their second studio or opened a new part of the gym to put them in. And that's basically what F45 is. F45 or some guys who were teaching at the tail end of that in the early 90s. You know, this is circuit training making a big comeback because it's such a wonderful combination of strength and of cardio work but it's also got so much community in it you know you, you're switching over you're people yeah people are all in the room uh, together the teacher is moving around the room you know it's actually really cheap to do it when we just put it in the corner of the gym we thought oh people are going to complain about this but they loved it that the weightlifters loved the energy of having and they were kind of disappointed when we, <laughs> we took the music and, and, and the, and the, the, the beautiful room. woman out of the, the, the corner of the gym it just, it feels fantastic. You feel exhilarated when you do it. You feel strong afterwards. We can just run classes back to back to back to back all day long and fill them. I haven't seen anything like this really since probably Body Pump 1995, you know? Mm -hmm. So have you been, has it been something you've been testing recently then? This, this Yeah, we, we, well, we took them out. We, when we launched our classes internationally, we were struggling to sell pump to people. Oh, you know, don't want to buy barbells. Our teachers can make up barbell classes themselves. Why do we want to buy this from you? Um, and it, that was hard work. The thought of, like, uh, of trying to sell people a whole room full of circuit equipment, all of our distributors at the time, because we had, everybody was independent distributors then, all of our distributors said, no, we, we can't sell this, except Japan. Right. You know, a hundred Konami company clubs, which were then called uh, People, company, People Company, opened these circuit classes yeah. and they went nuts. Yeah. But we, we eventually dropped it and what, what was uh, the circuit room and our gyms became like the grit studios for the, millenni the millennials. They had some boxing classes and things in, them at, in between at times. And now it's come right back full circle. And this ceremony class that we run, it's so good. We're... We're getting into all of our clubs as fast as we can because the ones that it's in, it's changed my life as a club owner. The new ones that we're going to build, we've got another class, a boxing class. We've always had boxing classes going way back. Emma had one uh, called Knockout in, in the 90s, which was a fabulous boxing circuit. And then we had one called Ringside in the 2000s. And now we've got Conquer, which is a, a studio one. We've also got Blitz, which is one just with punch dummies that you can put into your main studio. <laughs> Um, which you. you got to get us the punch dummy the, <laughs> for, and uh, and we've got um, another one. So we've got a whole bunch of boxing classes because, again, with empowerment, especially for women, but also for men, you know, that punching, that punching the crap out of something is, it's something that makes people feel good and makes them feel strong and empowered and gets rid of all of their, all of their anxieties and their stress and their helps them with their mental health. Also, there's been a lot of change. So through the pandemic, I mean, Les Mills has always invested in filming. So filming classes has always been something that's been a strength for the brand. Um, you've got Les Mills Plus, which is the digital version of, and I've noticed there's, there's so many new classes going on to that. How are you innovating in that space? And then secondly, you've also got new team. You're bringing in some wonderful new people uh, in the digital age. Tell us a bit about that change with the brand as well. So the innovations in filming, all right. I mean, basically what differentiates what we do from, from what everybody else in digital at least does is we spend three months making every class. So they get initially iterated by program director team, 25 programs now, and, and they get iterated, reiterated, then tested in our studios and then tested in the clubs, normally 40 or 50 times over three months before we film them. And we film with between five and 15 cameras uh, and top camera people and top directors. So it's not like, you know, even with, even with some of the big guys in the world, 
uh, without naming names. You know, they've got three teachers. cameras and <laughs> well, you know, one, two cameras. You know, and they're making the, the the teachers are making up their classes every day, and coming in and teaching new stuff. So it is fundamentally different. Uh, and we did that because we wanted to inspire teachers. Our instructors, we found that they watched the classes an average of five times, uh, and they subconsciously took in a whole bunch of the teaching technique of the best teachers in the world when we did that. So that was why we did it, and when we got to going digital um, and going out with virtual, you know, hey, we got all this good film that we've made <laughs> to inspire teachers, and it's inspiring for people as well. But we are constantly evolving how we film. You know, we're trying to make fitness movies. We think that our best stuff is three star movies. We think yeah. everybody else's best stuff is one star yeah. and some of them are in the minuses. We think we're 60% of the way there and we, we want to make five star fitness movies. So that once you get into really thinking about, you know, what movie makers do, that's sort of part of the craft of what we're doing. Um, digitally, we're doing what probably everybody else is. We're trying to get our, our, uh, our UX uh, really good, trying to make the stuff simple, catch up our, our tech debt, uh, and trying to find ways to motivate people more because, again, you know, we're in the motivation industry as much as we are a fitness industry. Motivating people at home is a lot uh, harder than, than it is motivating the gym with lots of humans around, you know, with wonderful teachers and with, with crowd energy and, and all of that stuff going on. Motivating them at home is tough. So the whole sort of gamification of the thing uh, is really, really just starting. What we call gamification now is, you know, um, it's, it, it's going to remember Pong. The, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what. We're at that stage. We're at that yeah. stage. And, and so, uh, so the, the real gamification, you know, we launched our, our VR body combat game uh, last Which year. Which has performed really well, right? And performed really, really well. New Surpri audience, completely new surprisingly audience. Surprisingly well. I yeah. think, you know, I think that it is so sort of basic in what we're doing there, but. If you think down that, down that avenue, imagine I watch my grandkids, you know, play team games, team video games. You know, when we get to that point, when fitness gaming gets to that point, that's where I think the future is. But there are squillions of dollars to be spent doing that. Oh, it's, yes. You have to spend an unbelievable amount of money to get to that level of gamification. But I think that that's where we'll be in 10 years. Mm -hmm our industry will be for motivating people to do it at home. Yep. But I think gyms will keep getting more and more motivating and more, more and more wonderful as well. How, how do you think that the gym location will look? Because we've seen when we when going back to the 80s when you had Group X Studios and then Group X Studios in big box gyms and, and now recently you have the standalone boutique and now you're starting to see some of these boutiques coming back in gyms or just a, a series of boutiques in a gym on their own. How do you see the gyms, those four? I walls? think the gyms will put boutiques on. I think they have to. Now, I had my first gyms were aerobic studios. The first ones that I owned myself, I had an aerobic studio in Auckland City and one in Christchurch and one in Sydney. When the gyms, you know, when mum and dad's gyms started putting in aerobic studios, we were out of business. Um, the interesting thing about boutiques is that you know, you've only got one thing you do, so you've got to do it really, really well. So they do an incredible job of, of mastering, you know, particular sort of genres of exercise. And that's something that we have to follow. You know, we, we have to follow them at developing incredible teachers. Um, you know, you can get digital all you like. Digital um, music hurt a lot of the record companies, but uh, it didn't hurt live performance. Live performance is bigger, you know, it's live right. yeah. bigger and more expensive than it ever was. So we've got to, you know, we've got to get better and better at recruiting and training uh, great teachers. And it's not that difficult to do. Everybody says, oh, it's so difficult to do. It isn't. You know, that's bullshit. I know so many people around the world who do it really well. And if you're looking to, to attract Gen Z, then get a great, smart, young Gen Z group fitness manager who's got a bit of hustle and get out there and you know get a bunch of their friends and all that stuff and you know it's easy it's the same old stuff a single great great teacher is going to bring and retain hundreds of members to your club and if you can build a team in it's thousands so that stuff remains uh, really important i think that we do have to bring the boutiques in i'm seeing that all around the world the clubs like midtown chicago uh, which is i believe the most successful club in the world you know five boutiques in there We've put in 
three boutiques in Auckland City. We've just, just been starting to roll out boutiques inside our other clubs. And it is, it's a life changer. It's, it's a winner. So I think that clubs will do that. And I think that's going to make it very difficult for the boutiques uh, in the future. It's going to be like the aerobic studios. You know, there were 10,000 aerobic studios uh, in the early 80s. And then by the end of the 90s, it were just about none. Uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a pessimistic thought because I, they're wonderful what the, what the boutiques are doing, but it's going to be tough for them. It's going to be really tough. Some of them are going to become full-scale gyms, mm. um, and some of the budget gyms are opening uh, HVLP what, level 1, level 2, level 3, and they'll put in studios in it. Some of them have got boutiques. So, you know, what's going to be the new normal? What's going to be the new middle? That's sort of going to be interesting, and we don't know because that comes out of human creativity, yeah. and, and that's always... Uh, just something that you can't exactly predict. Oh, great. So my, my, just my last question on that point, where, where does Les Mills fit into that? Because I guess in some respect, your, the boutiques and what you offer are, are kind of you know, competitors in, in a way, aren't they? So how, do, how, do, how does Les Mills play in that new future? Do you, do you power some of those boutiques within the clubs? or do, do you Some boutiques around the, the world are doing yeah. what we do, um, which is nice. And that will happen. Originally, the, the low-cost clubs didn't have us at all. But now, you know, there are thousands and thousands of low-cost clubs who have put, who have put in studios and have Les Mills classes. Um, but mainly, we will be powering the, the new generation of clubs which put boutiques inside. So we've got all these classes like Ceremony and like Conquer and a whole bunch of other, and the Trip and a whole bunch of other cool new boutique experiences that go inside clubs. So that's where we mainly fit. But I, that could turn out to be wrong. I, I always thought that... The, the low cost clubs would never take us, but here we are, and thousands of them. You know, they're one of our biggest customers in the world now. And then my last question: um, so you've got such a there's such a prolific backlog of content. You know, like it's it's so comprehensive and undeniable. I presume that's been taken into corporate and into business and schools and other things. We've got everything from kids programming right up to the oldies. Are you looking at all those other verticals aggressively? Uh, we, we have been trying to sell. We sell a bit to companies with virtual and a bit to companies with digital. Um, and, uh, and that's growing gradually. The schools one is one that I have a particular passion for. Right. You know, when we, when we created Born to Move, we thought this is going to be wonderful. We'll get it into every school in the world. And um, uh, there are a hell of a lot more schools than in our gyms. And yep, we'll exactly. develop healthy habits in kids. But it is very different selling something to a school to selling something to, to gyms. And what we've done recently with Born to Move is we just said, OK, it's free. And we put it free into schools and we put it free into gyms uh, in most countries, not all. Um, but uh, in is most Is that countries, working or are there more barriers? It's working right. incredibly and, and it's changing lives. Peer-to-peer -peer is wonderful. We get the older kids teaching yep. the younger kids and it changes them and it it's leaders, a whole lot of personal development yep. for them. Yep. Uh, and it's wonderful. And the schools love it. And the kids are, you know, getting, learning how to do this sort of fitness. And we're getting incredible teachers. You know, the kids who were the born to move kids, they are just some leaders of, our of rock future, stars yeah. on our videos <laughs> now coming through. You look at our videos. Yes. Some of that new way of teachers are mind-blowingly good. And they've come through born to move. So, so many lovely things about that. Yeah, that's, that's my favorite one that we're doing. Right, great. Thank you. Thank it's been you incredible much, and yeah. congratulations. So, David Stalker, you wear many hats. Today you were chairing at Europe Active, the EHFF here in Cologne. How was the, Congratulations on surviving. It's an enormous thing, holding a day together, especially Europeans with coffee and having to get them back into the room. How was the day for you and just maybe some highlights? Yeah, it's been an absolutely fantastic day. You're, you're completely right, absolutely exhausting, and, and perhaps we shouldn't offer European coffee. Uh, but, uh, but, yeah, we learn, and a gong, a really loud gong is what you need because I have a loud voice, but that wasn't enough to get them back in the room. Um, I thought the day was absolutely fantastic. You, you look at it, um, we've come out of a pandemic, and last year it was just all about just this pandemic moment. I guess when I listen, I wonder, have we taken on board or what are we doing to take on board the opportunities that came out of that pandemic? You know, we've we've spoken before at Ursa, I heard it quite often about this sort of move from fitness to health. I didn't hear that as much as I thought I would hear it today. I did hear it um, when you listened uh, to the, the Deloitte report and um, Herman speaking on particular companies that they were 
back to uh, balance sheets were adjusting and things were, were back to normal. Um, and people are smiling. And I find that a bit depressing because I'm not really interested in back to normal. I feel we've been hit by this big opportunity to whack balance sheets out of the way, to open up this hu huge market. And, um, and I, I know that the pressure that comes from those sort of capitalists, venture capitalists, the banks and all the rest of it to get back. And people have got to, got to pay bills, but I can't help but feel there's this enormous opportunity and we hold the key to this and that's that move from fitness to health. And it was kind of repeated in everyone's talks and I just wanted more conviction on it because I think it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely cru crucial to do that. So it was there, it was underlying um, in, in, in the talks. Um, it's quite hard when you've got a whole European audience to focus down on that sort of minutia of community because uh, I know that we're in the EU and I might be from a country <laughs> that's outside the EU, the EU but, but, <laughs> but those that are within, we, we know that out of the pandemic, actually, they all went back to their countries and they all became very, very local. And I think as a result, with it all opening up and with the challenges that come out of Ukraine and things like that, that there's this desire to ignore community, which is our other great big opportunity. I wanted to hear more of we as the fitness community. You heard it, you heard the word fitness community, but if you take that fitness community and then you play it on the move from fitness to health, actually we're starting to, to build some, some momentum. Um, so it was all there, it was all there. Um, and I just wanted personally to hear, to, to hear more more passion from it. I did like the, you know, Nereo uh, towards closing, Philip, uh, as always, and others, you know, um, Philip has been up there. May, may, you know, uh, when you're chairing these things, you just go on to a minor panic of whether his 20 minutes is actually going to be three and a half hours. <laughs> he said but, that. Yeah, he did, he did yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, his, his absolute passion about sort of Generation X and Generation Z and he really put that emphasis about how we're we're all part of the natural world that we we live in um and that we as the industry we're in have the biggest opportunity to to, to make a difference you know i born brought up in kenya chairman of a zoo as i said when i was when i was losing i love that i love that because if we can if we can use this industry to help the help the globe and we absolutely can i like that and that was repu repeated a few uh, a few times um, through the day. And then there was dramatic stories. Uh, you know, a Angela's story, wow, you know, that was... What was that for uh, everyone, people who yeah, were listening? Yeah, well, yeah, people who were listening. Well, and Angela there, we, we had no idea. I mean, I met her in, in Dubai, and as far as I could tell, she sell, sold really tasty, tasty protein bars. And they were really, and they're really healthy, and she's got them in all the top hotels. And, and it was extraordinary what she achieved in Forbes 30, 30 uh, lady. But, you know, she, she, she was kidnapped, uh, you know, uh, by, by the mafia and held to ransom and all paid off. So this was just such a dramatic story. And it was funny that you had this, this lady up there speaking and so hard, you can overcome, you can co overcome everything. And actually it's good to be challenged because you were you. And if you're not being challenged, it's not good enough. And if it, if it doesn't hurt, you need to make it hurt. It sounded like, sounded like one of my old rugby coaches actually, but, but, but with a, a much smiley, a happy face and a, about 15 stone lighter. Um, but, uh, and I, I, I love that. I love that kind of thing. I love that, you know, I love our industry and then the feeling of resilience and, and, and that. So for me, that, that plays to, to my personality. Um, looking around the room, I think that because there was no warning of, the, of it, there was kind of, what? You know, and they, they, were, they were literally, literally stuck on, on that. And then lots and lots and lots of digital stuff. Um, and uh, we keep, going on about digital stuff and we and we we know know it's there and if I haven't got the Europe active hat on I've got a, a my zone hat on so I pretty yeah digitally immersed uh, from that particular from that particular side but actually it was extraordinary listening to people particularly those who are professors in it who are who are just trying to trying to tie it into our everyday thinking and not making 
AI and everything. So, wow, what is this all about? Just embrace it, move with it, and it's all, it's all going to happen. So, um, for me, it was, it was a day that just went left, right, center, all over the places. I had moments where I thought, wow, we're, we're on, a, on a roll now. And then I had moments of, oh, dear, <laughs> oh, do we get back? Do we get back from that? But I guess I go in there and I, I, I go right back to fitness industry days, UK active days. And for me, it hasn't changed. More people, more active, more often, a much more educated industry hugely much more educated industry, this huge opportunity, health, fitness, community, digital, brilliant standards. And yeah, all day those messages were, were, were coming from, through in terms of transformation and leadership, a room, a room full of, of, of great leaders. So yeah, I, I, I've sort of left the room and right now there's a thug. <laughs> uh, and, and I need to put, put, put it all back into place. And, and uh, yeah, it was fantastic. Right. Well, I, go on, go on. Sorry, and I just, sorry, just my last thing is I, I think just in the way you've explained that is how everyone's feeling. I think everyone's been through the washing machine of yeah. change and it's been like 36 months of a lot, yeah. right? Everything taken away, everything thrown back, yeah. things gone like that, things gone like that, banks, wars, you know, everything, yeah. health, every stress you could imagine <laughs> yeah. thrust upon us yeah. in succession, often yeah. simultaneously. And so I think there is a settling period now, so it's no wonder you're feeling like that. And then you're representing Europe here, which is everyone's at a different life stage, um, you know, equipment, you'll see it through your equipment sales and things like It's just very, it's, there's a settling period, I think. And, and I, I am with you. I'm like, everyone says, oh, pre-19. We talk about pre-19 revenues, for example, but I think we have to be careful there because cohorts have changed. So everything is not the same. Money might be, you know, whatever, but what's happening under the hood has not. So expectations have changed. Yeah. Digitalization, you know, if we don't sort of stay on that, you know, other businesses that are very focused on that, who manage their data very well and have enormous pockets, you know, have the ability to come in and, and, and sort of spend it in this sector yep. as well. So yep. I think it's not surprising that you're feeling like yeah. you're feeling because that is what the world is like right now. Even in reporting on the US versus uh, yep. UK and, and Europe, it's been very different. Yep. Like, we did not hear health and wellness anywhere near as much as we did in San Diego a few weeks ago, yep. I would say. It's there, and it's it was mentioned, yep. but it was like front, and yeah, we yeah. felt at Ursa. Yeah, and I would agree. I was at Ursa, and that's, you know, yeah. the people I spoke to, that was exactly yeah. how I felt. And it was interesting. I did One thing that was very clear is we've got to get our data sorted out. Absolutely. And we, we've, we've just got to do it. We've got to do it as an industry, not as in, you know, uh, yeah. if we're going to be taking seriously, we've got to be able to prove it statistically, factually, and be able to put down those numbers. And that message was there. Well, we've had some interesting guests actually talking about data. We had Grace at XC. We yeah. had, um, you know, so there is yeah. some decent work being yeah, yeah. done. You know, obviously the Deloitte work, um, this, and a lot of the studies that were done over the pandemic to prove essentialism, I guess, that needed to be done to exactly, you know, prove that either on Capitol Hill or at the Parliament's yeah. here. So hopefully that's underway, but you are right between the wearables and the equipment company and the data sets and yeah. the club management and the aggregators, like if all of that can be pulled in somehow, like we know a lot, there is a lot of data, yeah. it's just yeah. not normalised and it's not talking yeah. to each other right. In, in the US, we felt a huge feeling this year of collaboration. Did you feel that in the room today? Yeah, I, I no. Right. Uh, and and it's funny because I was really I love collaboration and I'm all about the team and it's just me. So I I was really aware of it. And you know, I I, I thought why isn't that? Because um, and I think it's political. Um, and I don't see this as someone who 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 is British and, and is outsider. I actually think that. Not everything is sparkly and rosy in the world of the European Union. There are a lot of differences in in the, 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 the countries. Everything's perfect in the United States. <laughs> Let me just tell you. <laughs> yeah. And I think then you add the Ukraine bomb. Oh yeah. It was the the only time where I felt the 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 T and team the togetherness came out clearly was because we wanted to put our arms around a girl who's gone up there who who's getting up there and talking about something that's going on not so many hundred miles from where we are now that was the you know and I think that's probably why you know we covered a little bit irrelevant against that well, backdrop. Well, two things. I, should, I yeah. should actually pull that comment back a little bit in the sense that we have spent a lot of time with the world active. Crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's definitely that group That's coming right. together. Yeah. So I mean, I, I, I want to say it's not all bad news. That's not the, not no. the message I'm yeah. trying to say. I'm just saying it wasn't coming up naturally uh, in conversation. And the other thing is, back in the US, 
we're further away from the war and it's yeah, not yeah. front of mind yeah. only because it's just not on our land mass. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, that's probably yeah. why there's a little bit of that. And I yep. think that's the perfect description. Yep. And I love the fact that World Active was here and yep. that is happening yes. and that, you know, old views and misunderstandings, let's describe it, are being put to bed and that, that, Can that, we all that is... Can get on with it? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Outside of healthcare and data, what what what's one other thing after coming up, coming off the event today? Do you think that needs to stay on the agenda? Um, and it wasn't spoken about a lot today, but I think we we've slipped away from talking about our people. You go to a club and you're buying that experience, and yes, you'll have that great kit and you'll have the great classes and all the rest of it, but our people are just just so so fantastic and so what I feel has slipped on the agenda is we are remembering the great people the Augie, Reiner, all these these fantastic people but all those instructors out there and all those people out there and those personal trainers who went through this pandemic like the rest of it did I mean was there ever a set of people maybe apart from circus performers, less suited to be told to go and sit at home than, than our instructors. They, they, you know, it was uh, uh, terrible for them and, and what's come out of it, I'm sure, is a lot of mental health and all the rest of it. But more importantly, I, 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 love, our pe I, love, I love the people who are in this industry and when you go to a club. I didn't really, at any time today, nothing seemed to go back. We talked about leadership, we didn't talk about who we were leading. Right. Yeah, and, uh, you know, that uh, is, is an important part for me. Excellent. Well, Dave, thank you so much. It's a thank pleasure you. as always. <laughs> thank you for listening to this episode. If you've got any value from it whatsoever, then please do us a favour, like, subscribe, tell somebody, and that will help us to be able to continue to do more of these and help you escape your own personal limits. Thanks for listening.